Some of the things that we learned this past Sunday were practical signs to help us find and stay on the road called faith. So praise the Lord. And uh, I just jotted down some notes from Sunday, not that I'm going to re-preach uh, Geo's message, but I just wrote this down. Uh, this is how it struck me. Um, there is an attitude of faith, number one. There's a language of faith, number two. There's a posture of faith, number three. And there's a sound of faith, number four. And so the question uh, that I get asked is why do we emphasize faith so much at this church? <laughs> well, it's because the Bible emphasizes faith. And I'm just amazed at what we've done in the church world. I mean, you can never get away from the message of faith. After all, we can't get saved without faith, can we? No, for by grace are we saved through faith. If you come to God, you must believe that he is. I mean, that takes faith. And we're told in the scripture repeatedly uh, that the just shall live by faith. Well, once Jesus is your Lord and Savior, once you make that decision, you are now the just and you have to live by faith. Uh, also, the scripture makes it very clear that we cannot please God by faith. And certainly um, in 1 John, you can make a note of that, 1 John 5, uh, faith is the victory that overcomes. So to say that faith is an important subject probably would be an understatement. You know, I mean, really, you go to church. I mean, I would think that you'd want to build your faith and hear about faith, wouldn't you? All right. Glory be to God. OK. Amen. 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 So we're going to find our way over to Mark's gospel, chapter 11. Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. You want, you want to go to Mark, chapter 11. And we'll just continue on this theme. I don't think we've ever gotten off the theme of faith and we never will. I think there's a Bible verse in there somewhere. I could be mistaken. Maybe it's just my imagination that when Jesus comes back, when he returns, will he find what? Faith. And I'm happy to say we're doing our part. <laughs> Amen. So uh, Mark's gospel, chapter 11. Two verses of scripture here I'll highlight for you. Um, <clears throat> actually, let's just take it in context here so we can do that. So you're in Mark 11, beginning in verse 12. On the morrow, when they were come from Bethany, he, Jesus, was hungry. Verse 13, and seeing a fig tree afar off, having leaves, he came, if haply he might find anything thereon. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for the time of figs was not yet. And Jesus answered and said unto it, No man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever. And his disciples heard it. Verse 15, they went into Jerusalem. Jesus went into the temple, began to cast out them that sold and bought in the temple, overthrew the tables of the money changers, the seats of them that sold doves. And he would not suffer that any man should carry any vessel through the temple. And he taught, saying unto them, Is it not written, My house shall be called of all nations the house of prayer? But you have made it a den of thieves. Now, I don't know if we can fully appreciate what just happened here, what Jesus just did. Uh, this is called the cleansing of the temple, and maybe even your Bible may have that uh, at the heading, the cleansing of the temple, or Jesus cleanses the temple. It says he began to cast out, and he overthrew, and he wouldn't allow anybody to carry vessels through the temple. He made a whip and drove out the animals, uh, one of the gospel writers says. So this was a pretty um, active scene. <laughs> so he just spoke to that fig tree and then he goes into this situation. Um, I'm of the opinion that they probably weren't sitting around contemplating the fig tree thing. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking they were probably like, whoa, whoa, we ain't never seen nothing like this before. That's like somebody coming into church and just throwing everything, tipping things over, throwing things, not letting you carry. I mean, just, 
and, and please don't misunderstand what I'm saying, not letting people carry their beverage in and out of church, uh, the sanctuary, not letting, the, you know, just we're so accustomed to just being relaxed and comfortable that if somebody came in here and upset our routines like that, wouldn't you be like, uh, what the heck is going on here, right? That's exactly what's happening. So, verse number uh, 19, and when evening was come, he went out of the city, and in the morning, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter, calling to remembrance, said unto him, Master, behold, the fig tree which thou cursed is withered away. Like, mamma mia, what the heck, Lord? Jesus answering saith unto them, you like that? I got some other cool tricks that I can do too. He doesn't say that. That's not what Jesus said, because that's not what Jesus did. In fact, in my Bible, I have it highlighted, Jesus answering saith unto them, have faith in God. Well, at the very least, you can have faith in God, right? Here it is, the faith business again. I told you we can't get rid of the faith message. Can't get away from it. Have faith in God, but in the, in the margin of my Bible, and probably any good reference Bible will tell you, uh, in the original, it says, have the faith. It's, it, it means have the faith of God. Hmm. Where do you get the faith of God from? Ah, we'll get to, we'll get to that another time. So this is what Jesus said to the disciples. So here in Mark 11, and, and before I go any further, I want you to know that this is probably one of the most concise instructions on faith that we have. It's brief. It's to the point. There's no ambiguity or confusion about it. I mean, it's just boom, here it is. Have the faith of God. And now Jesus is about to show us how the faith of God works. Two basic principles. He says in verse 23, for verily I say unto you. So Jesus is now going to instruct us, right? That whosoever shall say unto this mountain. Well, what mountain? Whatever mountain. Whatever the mountain is in your life. Whosoever shall say. Now, who does whosoever include? Everybody. Whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass. He shall have whatsoever he prays for earnestly with weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. Doesn't say that. No, it says he shall have whatsoever he saith. That's one thing about the King James Version is that it's just got such a, a way about it. And, and it, it forces you to stop and think, well, wait a minute, what exactly did he just say here? He just gave you two basic principles. You can have what you say regardless of what you pray. In fact, you are having what you say in spite of what you pray. Really, in this particular verse, verse 23, and I could be missing it. That's why I'm just making sure as I'm reading verse 23, saying to this mountain, be there a movie, the cast is not down. Verse 23 doesn't even mention prayer there. Did you notice that? It mentions saying, not doubting in your heart, believing, and, and you're going to have what you say. Well, that's interesting, isn't it? Now, when you get to verse 24, it says, Therefore I say unto you what things soever you desire when you pray. Believe that you receive them and you shall have them. Well, when does the believing come? Before the receiving, before the having, before you see it or experience it. You have to believe it first. Now, I know this is a bit confusing and we're going to just take our time here. But when it comes to the mountains of our life, and a mountain certainly, I would say, a mountain would be symbolic or representative of something that's bigger than you. That there it is, and it ain't going nowhere. Here I am. 
Yep, you went to bed looking at me and you wake up and I'm still here. <laughs> I'm not going anywhere. It could be a mountain of sickness. It could be a mountain of debt. It could be a mountain of fear or confusion. Whatever it is, there are mountains in our life that need to be dealt with. And really, we don't even have to pray about these mountains. Not according to verse 23. In fact, he doesn't even tell us to plead with the mountain or try to bargain with the mountain or argue or debate or reason. Well, the reason why you should move out of my life is because I've been a pretty good Christian. Who are you talking to when you say that? Well, the mountain. It says to talk to the mountain. Yeah, it tells the mountain. You speak to the mountain, you tell it to go. So these are two basic principles. You believe in your heart, but you have to speak it with your mouth. And don't Google the mountain. Don't analyze the mountain. And stop complaining about it and going to every prayer meeting in town. Could you all just pray about this? I'm just asking my prayer warriors to pray everywhere. Okay, I thank God that we can have prayer. And I thank God that people will respond and pray for us. Thank God for that. But the bottom line is, when it's your mountain, it needs to hear your voice. Not somebody else's, because it's your deal. This is your situation. This is, this is your issue. Well, I declare to you by the Spirit of the Sovereign God that by this time tomorrow, that mountain will have disappeared, and it's still there. Because you don't really believe it. you got to believe you have to believe. And, and, and too often, people are not really believing. They're just giving mental assent to, oh, I believe. No, you don't. You're just a hoping and a wishing. And this is, this is about as simple as it gets when it comes to faith, because Jesus, all Jesus did was speak to a tree. A tree is an inanimate object, right? Oh, I know it's a living thing and all that, but I'm talking about trees don't talk to you. Trees don't do this. And I've heard people say, yes, that tree was mocking him, and he answered it back. I mean, do you think the tree stuck its tongue out and went, nah, 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 nah? I mean, come on. I mean, if, if faith will work on a fig tree that really, you might as well just say it, say it the way it is, a fig tree that's minding its own cotton-picking business. And Jesus said, nobody's eating from you ever again. I would imagine the disciples probably went, okay, cuckoo. Then they go and they take care of the cleansing of the temple. That was quite the show to see and to behold. Probably ticked off a lot of people. Jesus doesn't even miss a beat, man. They just go right by it. In fact, Peter, Peter called his attention to it. It's like Jesus wasn't even paying any attention because he knew when he spoke to it, that was it. Are we that convinced? Do we have that belief in our own hearts that when we speak to that mountain, that's it. I don't even, I do not even give it my attention. I do not consider it. I will not consider it. In fact, that's one of, that's one of the important lessons of faith is not to consider. <laughs> consider what? Well, like Abraham. I mean, you do understand Abraham was, was pretty old when, when he had a promise. You understand that? And so, I mean, let's just let's just kind of, you know, talk a little bit about this. You know, here's Abraham getting a promise from God. You're going to be the father of many. And, and of course, you know, there comes Isaac. Now, the reason we have all this trouble over there in the Middle East and over in Israel is because of Abraham. <laughs> right. <clears throat> I mean, you know, Abraham did have two sons. He had one son by a handmaid, by a servant girl. Well, I guess Abraham and his wife thought it was a good idea because she wasn't able to get pregnant or whatever was going on there. You know, so that's why you have two people, two groups of people that can say, well, Abraham is our father. You're right. <laughs> You're right. But the promise came through Isaac. Enough said about that. So here's Abraham. I get this promise from God, you know, and my wife's going to get pregnant. At what age was she? 90? Abraham about 100? I mean, a 100-year-old man and a 90-year-old woman do not have babies anymore. 
Of course, she didn't have babies, but to say that you're going to get pregnant, you'd be like, I I'm sorry, that doesn't work. But yet that was it. And, and the Bible actually tells us that Abraham did not consider his own body or the deadness of his wife's womb. But he just said, you know what? God is faithful. God is faithful. If God said it, that's it. I don't have to consult with anybody. I don't need to go see my primary care physician or an in vitro specialist or whoever these people are. You know, I'm just trying to get cute and clever up here because that's what we do. That's what we do. Instead, giving glory to God. God God's faithful. I don't know how he's going to do this. But he didn't consider his own body because had he been considering that mountain, that would be his mountain, wouldn't it? He'd be talking to his friends down at the coffee shop. Hey, uh, Jim Bob, <laughs> I don't even know how this is going to work. I'm an old coot. My wife, you ought to see her. She's older than dirt. I mean, dear God. Well, see, when, when God gives a promise and God has given us a book full of promises, it doesn't matter your condition physically. It doesn't matter the condition or the state of the affairs here in your, your hometown, your country, the nation, the world. Irrelevant. The word of God still will produce and it will, it will still work. And Jesus is saying, listen, you want to know how that fig tree thing happened, Peter? It's because of the faith message that I'm trying to convey and, and, and communicate with you. And I'm trying to get you guys to understand this because this is how you can turn the world upside down or right side up. It's just walk in the reality of what I've made you. Walk in the reality of who you are. Simply walk in the reality of what I've done for you. Walk in the reality of what I've given you and promised you. And if you just, if you say to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea. And if you don't doubt in your heart, but you believe that what you say is going to come to pass, you're going to have whatever you say. And the, and the interesting thing about this is that we are already having what we say based upon what we believe in our heart. And these little faith confessions that, that we sometimes are tempted to make in the hope that we can make something happen, that's not what this is about either. My faith confession is based upon the finished work of Jesus. It's what's already been done. If I'm confessing healing by his stripes that was healed, I'm not confessing that to get healed. I already am healed with sickness attacking me. I'm trying to get that stuff to leave and get my body to act right. But I'm not waiting for God to give me something he's already given me. And here Jesus is talking to whosoever's going to have whatsoever. And that's pretty broad and all encompassing. And when I think about this, really, because this is so concise um, and so simple, uh, this is probably the best example we have, really. And, and it applies to everybody. So this works for everybody, saint and sinner alike. No, sir, it's already happening. If you watch some of these videos where people, they're trying to help you achieve a better you, to reach your dreams and have your goals, um, and I don't have all the language and the, and the terminology and all the expression, but people on occasion will send me some things too, and some of it's good to listen to, but you got to understand something. There are people out there who are using these principles that aren't Christians, but they're having success. And they're teaching other people to have success. You believe something, you speak it, it'll manifest. Whatever it is, that's what's happening in our life anyway. People who go around and just say, I, ne I never get the good deals. You ain't never going to get any good deals. I don't care how prayed up you are. I never get the good parking spaces. Nobody ever gives me a break. I always, I'm always last in line. You know what? Stop saying that. How about you start changing? You can change your world by changing your confession. <laughs> really, it's the only way you're going to do it. Because God is not withholding any good thing from us. Of course, verse 24 is just, that, that's just like a double whammy. He said, I say unto you, what things soever you desire. What do you think that includes? 
Wow. Now, you understand something. If your heart is for the Lord and, and Jesus is living in you and, and you have a life that's committed to him, you know, you're not going to desire things that are wrong. You're not going to pray about those things. But what things soever you desire, when you pray, when you pray, wait until you receive them before you believe and then you will have. No, but that's what people do. They wait until they feel better to start declaring, by his stripes I was healed or I'm healed and whole. They wait until they feel better before they go, hallelujah, praise God, I am the healed of the Lord. Jesus, by your stripes I am healed. I am already redeemed from the curse of this thing. Not wait. Jesus has already redeemed us from the curse of the law. Not waiting to. Christ has already redeemed us from the curse of the law. So we make the mistake by waiting until, and that's how the devil can whip us. Because he's got you thinking and acting like it hasn't happened yet, but Jesus already went to the cross. He already died. He already went through the divine process. He was already made to be sin for us. His, he was already broken and bruised and, and beaten. I mean, that's why he said, as, when you take communion, as often as you do it, uh, do it in remembrance of me. Proclaim what I've done for you. Proclaim what I have already done for you in the face of contradictions, in the face of circumstances, and in the face, right, right smack, right in the shadow of these mountains, just declare what he's already done for you. I mean, this is how I live my life. In fact, the Bible says, just shall live by faith. So in other words, every time I get a pain, let me tell you something. The older I get, <laughs> I'm like, what? What is this now? I don't just say, oh, oh, what if it's arthri arthritis? Arthritis. I, I wonder if it's him and his brother, Bruce, Bruce-itis. <laughs> you know, Arthur and Bruce, the, the Ritus brothers. I mean, I'm like, why do we automatically do that? Because we are programmed by this world system, aren't we? In fact, you know what else people are? People are just programmed to accept that. Well, if you've had chicken pox, guess what's in your body? And guess what you're at risk for? And you don't want that, so you need this shot. And I'm like, that scares the boop out of me. And then I thought, wait a minute, because I go to the doctor, man, and they get you, they, they make you afraid. Well, I don't want that to happen. Well, you need this shot. Well, you, and then you need this because you're at risk for that. And then you got it. And I'm like, what? Oh, my God. Well, I don't want this to happen. And I don't want that. to. And then the funny thing is then people go get the flu shot and they get sicker than a dog with the flu. Well, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So wait a minute. At what point do you draw the line and say, Lord? This mountain of sickness right now that everybody's coming down with this RSV or whatever, whatever's going around right now. Sometimes you just got to fight the fight and just press through, right? And hope it doesn't hit you. Well, why do we do that to ourselves? I mean, I check myself on a regular, like on a daily, I have to check myself and say, dude, you didn't just talk to that person because you were afraid you might catch their cooties, right? It's like, oh, I guess so, Gare. Psh, psh. No, no, speak to that mountain. I mean, there's a great passage of scripture. It's even in the Old Testament. It said, a thousand shall fall at your side, 10,000 at your right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. I would imagine if I saw a thousand fall on one side, ten thousand on another side, I, I would imagine it might be a bit unnerving. And you might be tempted to run and hide and crawl under a rock. But what if you just stood there and said, no, you don't. No, you don't. In Jesus name, it shall not come nigh me. So you got to learn how to respond back to the mountain by speaking the word only. I think that's what G.O. was talking about here. You have a, uh, there's an attitude of faith. There's an attitude of faith that says, uh-uh, the word of God dictates and determines my attitude and my response. Not what the commercial on TV says. Not what the news report or the CDC says. 
Oh, it's going to be a bad one. Every single year it's going to be a bad one for something. There's the mountain saying, hello, here I am. And what do we do as children of God? Oh, we better go. I'm going to, guys, I'm, I'm just going to go out the back door. Don't breathe on me. Now, use wisdom and discretion at all times. Use wisdom and discretion. But guys, we can't keep cowering and backing up and retreating every time a mountain says, hello. I mean, Jesus didn't seem to think anything of it. He said, hey, if there's a mountain in the way, speak to it. Don't pray about it, just speak to it. Don't Google it, don't debate, don't argue, don't call the doctor. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying don't call the doctor, but doc, do you think this is okay? I, you know, sometimes I wonder what the doctors think of us. Just one nuance, a, a word or a sentence or a syllable, even a look from a doctor, and it has the power to send shockwaves up and down our spine. Hmm. As they look and they go, hmm. Oh my God, what does that mean? I just said, hmm. I just said, hmm, because somebody misspelled the word. <laughs> you know. So we need to, as, 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 we, as we try to get somewhere tonight, the, the principles of faith have never changed and they never will. We believe. We believe. What? We believe the word of God to be the absolute truth about us. That's what we believe. And whatever that mountain is in your life, whatever the mountain is in your life. So as an example, a mountain of sickness. Now, as long as you're alive on planet Earth, you're going to have to contend with it. You're going to have to deal with uh, sickness and disease knocking. Sometimes it knocks louder uh, than at other times. First Peter, if I, if, and, and I'm not telling you that I'm not or that I am, so how about this? When that mountain shows up, and maybe I wasn't even expecting, now I've got to be honest with you, I press through quite a bit um, in my life, and, and I don't say a whole lot because otherwise I'd be whining and crying all the time. Oh, he's dealing with this now. Oh, he's dealing with that. He's overcoming this and that. There are times when out of nowhere it hits you and you're like, that mountain just showed up unannounced. It just hit. And it's big and it's ugly. And 1 Peter chapter 2, so if you speak into the mountain, now he's not talking about you just speaking any old thing. These are the principles of faith. I'm trying to show you something. If, if you're dealing with a mountain of sickness, you might just, Open up your Bible to 1 Peter 2, 24 and say to the mountain, Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. Healed. That word healed in the Greek, it's always used in the New Testament for physical healing. That's what you can say to that mountain. By whose stripes I was healed. So there's that mountain saying, I ain't going anywhere. <laughs> I'm not leaving. In fact, you're going to end up in the hospital for a long time. <laughs> you're going to be on a breathing. You're going to be on a ventilator. Huh. Where do you think that's coming from? It's coming from a defeated foe who's like the Wizard of Oz behind the curtain going, Silence! And you're like, who is that old coot back there? Exactly. It's that defeated devil who's got his voice amplified, just pretending to be something or someone he isn't in your life. And there we are. You see what I'm saying? By whose stripes I was healed. If I was, then I am. If I am, then I is. I am the healed of the Lord, and I am speaking to you, and I am telling you, you got to go. And if you don't doubt in your heart, but you believe that what you say will come to pass, what does the Bible say? You will have whatever you say. He never said you won't have any difficulties. He never said you won't have any obstacles. He never said there won't be things to overcome or challenges he never said that. He said to the contrary. He said, you're going to have trouble. 
You can expect it while you're alive on this earth. You can expect to have trouble. One of the things lately I've been trying to develop in me is an attitude because faith has an attitude. That's, that's what we heard Sunday, right? Faith has an attitude. I've been trying to develop this attitude that I am not going to share my body with cancer or any other sickness or disease. Oh, you think you can just declare that? Yeah. I'm not going to share my body with, and then you fill in the blank. But you have to develop this mindset and this attitude by feeding on the Word of God. The Word of God will take hold. It'll settle, and the Word of God will grow within you. And you'll get to the place where you absolutely positively believe that there is only room for me and Jesus in this body. And I am not allowing anyone else to move in here. No demon, no devil, no spirit of infirmity. Yeah, but pastor, it's a bad flu season. And your point is what? Well, people are in the hospital all over the place. And your point is what? I mean, Jesus wasn't even going to acknowledge that fig tree. Peter said, whoa, whoa, troops, ho! And Jesus is like, have the faith of God, Pete. It's what I've been trying to tell you. I've been trying to pattern this for you. I've been trying to model and demonstrate this for you, Peter. How many times did Jesus have to say, how long I got to put up with you? With you, how long I got to put up with you? Have the faith of God. You got to believe, you got to speak. Now, here's the thing. The beautiful thing is we have the written word of God today so that we could speak that to the mountain. We can speak that to the mountain. That's for those people, those folks who are um, dealing with a mountain of sickness. Let me show you this in uh, <clears throat> Philippians. Philippians, just back up and you'll eventually hit Philippians. It's in there somewhere. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Where is it? It's, it well, in my Bible, it's page number 222. So in Philippians, what if, what if you're dealing with lack and insufficiency and you're just not sure if you can make ends meet and you don't know what you're going to do because you're on a fixed income? Well, first of all, if you think you're on a fixed income, stop. Because Jesus didn't fix your income. You did. He says in Philippians 4, verse number 19, but my God shall supply most of your need. All. Oh, that's a powerful three-letter word. Verse 19. But my God shall supply all your need according to the size of your paycheck. No. According to your portfolio. No. According to your pension. No. No. No, but according to his riches and glory. Now, understand this. God does not have any currency in heaven. He can't give you any money from heaven because there is none up there. My goodness gracious, the streets are paved with gold up there. I suppose he could flick some gold dust down on us. But the money that you need is down here, and that money will move in your direction if you abide by certain principles. Oh, boy. Yeah. One of those principles is giving, sowing. You cannot, I promise you, Jeff has the offering plate because we will get to that in just a moment. You cannot outgive God. You will not outperform God. If you firmly believe in your heart that giving will produce a harvest, that sowing will always produce reaping, if you, if you are convinced that everything you do for him, if you do it as under the Lord and you do it as a seed, guess what? It comes back to you. You can't outgive God. It's a law, the law of seed time and harvest. It's in every area of our life. In fact, doesn't the Bible say, well, let's go find it, Galatians. Galatians. Because I just want to conclude here and so we can get to the giving port portion. Galatians, you want to go to the last chapter, which is chapter 6 in Galatians. <clears throat> so if you're dealing with a mountain of sickness, go to 1 Peter 2, 24. Speak that to that mountain and say, out you go. 
out you go, goodbye. Now, does it mean it's gonna vaporize instantly? Well, no, because the fig tree didn't do that, right? The Bible says it started at the roots where you couldn't see anything, but it started, as soon as Jesus spoke that word, something happened. And see, the mistake that a lot of people make is that they'll speak the word, they'll make a confession or a declaration, and because it doesn't go poof, they, they go, well, that didn't work. No, it did work. It did work. Watch this in, in, in uh, Galatians 6. Are you there? Verse 7. Be not deceived, Galatians 6, 7. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Ooh, I like that, don't you? Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Well, if you want tomatoes or tomatoes, then you don't take corn or peas and sow that, do you? Good heavens, no. You're going to reap. You're going you're gonna to reap whatever you sow. He, verse 8, for he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the spirit shall of the spirit reap everlasting life. He applies that language to spiritual things as well. And then verse 9, let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we are good boys and girls. Nope. We shall reap if we pray long prayers during that interim. No. We shall reap if we faint not. It's coming. It's happening. You may have to stir yourself up again. It's never too late to stir yourself up. It's never too late to go out there and say, man, I've got some seed in the ground. And Father, I just want to thank you that this seed is producing. What seed are we talking about? I don't know. That's between you and God. Do you know you could sow seeds of friendship? You could sow seeds of honor. And whatever you sow, you reap. So for people who are whining and complaining that they're loveless and Byron, what if you just start sowing love? What if you just start being a loving person, a lovely person? What if you just started doing things with no motivation other than the pure, simple act of giving because love gives? You'll start reaping it in due season if you faint not, but people get impatient and then they try to make things happen and you end up with an Ishmael. Hello. Thanks, Abraham. And Hagar. And so if you're looking, if you're looking to complain about the mountain of lack, if you're looking to Google the mountain of lack, if you're looking to partner with people who make all these promises to get you out of lack, and if you hook up with me, <laughs> how about you just take the word of God, start meditating, start feeding on it, start talking it over and over and over, read the thing, speak it, believe it, and guess what, eventually, I'll tell you, there are times when it just bubbles up in me and, and I love it. I love it because it's not always that way. Sometimes my flesh is giving me fits and it's like, oh, dude, your head's hurting. Just chill. Drink another cup of Java. Like, dude, it's too early for this. You know, people think that I wake up, boom, I'm ready to go. Oh, glory to God. Let me wake him up at four in the morning. And I mean, he's going to preach me a fiery sermon. As soon as he opens up his eyes, I'm like, click. Call back later. <laughs> Sometimes when they have to awaken me for an emergency, some of them, for the most part, they've done an amazing job because actually they're calling me at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning and they know I'm sleeping. So nobody in their right mind is going to call and say, were you sleeping? Did I wake you up? Yeah, I was sleeping and yes, you woke me up. But it's nice that the, we have some great, first responders and, and telecommunicators here. Pastor Gary, uh, hi, this is so-and-so with the county. Um, 
They're requesting, and so they'll go real gent. They don't just go, hey, what's up, dude? Wake up, they need you. And then they'll make sure that you understood and that you can acknowledge and that you're with it enough before they hang up because they need you to respond. Praise the Lord. There's, there's so much going on around us that it's, just, it's easy to just get lost in the translation or just get swept away with the current. And you got to realize that things are happening. You can stir yourself up. You can feed on the word. And it starts bubbling up. And all of a sudden, you'll just feel it like at the most unusual time. And you just want to have a run and fit. And you just break out into tongues. And you're like, I think I like this. It doesn't always happen that way. But there are times when it's just like, man, you feel like you are on top of the world and you can conquer anyone and anything. Bring it on. Right. And if you've never had that experience, you need to stay in the word more. You need to confess it and speak it more. You need to believe it more, whether it's financial, whether it's it's some type of material thing or whether it's an emotional, psychological thing or whether it's physical, whatever it is, whether you think that you're lacking. Let me close with this one before we get to the offering. Look at Colossians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. I went the wrong way. General Electric Pepsi Cola. That's how you remember Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Colossians chapter 1. This might be an all-encompassing one for you, so this covers all mountains. This one right here. So, if you're looking for, well, which verse can I use to cover every mountain? Well, this one right here probably. (laughs) You ready? Colossians chapter 1, you there? It says this in verse number Well, let's go to verse number 12. Giving thanks unto the Father, this is Colossians 1, 12, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us. Notice it says, who hath delivered us, who hath already done did deliver us, who delivered us from the power of darkness. Well, what would that include? Anything of the power. In, within the power of darkness, anything that's of the power of darkness. You've been delivered from it and you've been translated into the kingdom of his dear son. Not someday. Someday your bodies will. But that ain't that day. This ain't that day. But spiritually speaking, you are already taken out from the power of darkness, the power of darkness and of evil and of lack and insufficiency and of hatred and fear and confusion has no authority over you. You are free already because you've been translated into the kingdom of his dear son. It's already happened. Someday you'll get your body renewed and changed. I mean, some of us, it's going to happen in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. Others are going to have to lay our bodies to sleep in the grave. But either way, we're getting our bodies back. And so what's going to happen now is that as you face uncertainty and as you face overwhelming confusion and fear and all kinds of problems in life, you can say to that mountain, hey, I've already been delivered from the power of darkness and I've already been translated into the kingdom of his son. I'm not going to just let you bully me. You got to go, fear. You got to go, confusion. You got to go, evil, whatever it is. Maybe it's a bad habit. Maybe it's something you're trying to shake. I just can't seem to stop eating pecan pie. Well, I can understand that one. You know, but if you've been taken out of darkness and set into light, then pecan pie cannot lord it over you. My wife made beautiful, uh, uh, she does her um, tortilla, she, she could, makes her own. And, and the, she had the, the beef, it was beautiful. The way it was seasoned and just flavored so good. So, you know, soft shell taco action, big, beautiful homemade tortilla shells and, and homemade and put that beautiful meat on there. And, uh, and then the seasoning and then the, the, the uh, uh, white stuff, what's that, the sour cream and, and all the fixings and everything else and all the juices. And you just roll that baby up and you're sitting there. And you're like, oh, I don't want this to end. I mean, you know. It's not Italian, but Mexican's pretty good. And, and I'm eating it, and I'm thinking, oh, this is so good. Normally, normally, what Gary does is he inhales the first one before it even hits the bottom, and he's already making a second one. 
And then he inhales the second one, and then he's like, man, I'm going to go for a third. Well, this time I said, no, you don't. That's one taco, you're done. No, you want to have a little bit of rice? I didn't stuff it in there. I put the rice on the side. I said, ah, oh, you eat a little bit of rice there. My wife says, you're only having one? <laughs> I says, yeah, because I've been delivered from the power of gluttony. I have been delivered. I've got self-control and I'm going to exercise it. And I got to tell you something. A beautiful thing happened. By the time I finished that one reasonably sized taco and had a little bit of a reasonable size amount of that nice, beautiful Mexican rice she made. And then I drank my water and my coffee. A beautiful thing happened. My stomach went, oh, I'm full. I am so glad I didn't shove two or three down there because then I'd be coming in like, Gio, can you preach for me again? I overate. This verse will apply to everything. Gluttony, stupid, well, you can't fix stupid, but stupidity. I mean, there's so many different things that it will apply to. And you just have to know that God has already done things for you so that you could walk free. You're not waiting for God to show up. He already showed up 2,000 years ago. And, and so when we prepare, well, let me, I got to throw, I got to do this. Let's just go to Psalm real quick and we're going to receive the offering. But this is a beautiful verse right here. It's Psalm, the 23rd Psalm. I, I got to just show you this because I don't know. I, I think about the things in our lives that maybe, I don't know. There's just so much that goes on in my head sometimes. I, it's a magical place, but it gets loud up there too. And I just got to say, dude, stop. Um, because the older I get, I think about the future and I think about, you know, I might want to spend more time on the beach. Heck, I don't go to the beach anymore at all. You know, I don't know. Maybe I want to take a trip up into the mountains and speak to the mountain from the top of the mountain this time. So you go, ha, ha, ha. You know, I don't know, any number of things. You know, and these things go through my head and it's like, well, <laughs> You know, yeah, you don't have this in place and you don't do this and you don't do that. Yeah, because I'm a preaching machine and I intend to preach my way into heaven. That's why, buddy. I answer myself all the time and I say, that's why, because I'm going to preach myself right into glory. That's what I'm going to do. I'm preaching myself into heaven. But the, the 23rd Psalm, verse 1, the Lord is my shepherd. I'm full of wants. That's not what that says. The Lord is my shepherd. I'm always lacking. No, that says the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Who are you going to believe? When that mountain shows up and says, dude, you ain't got enough. You're not going to be able to take those trips. You're not going to be able to do it. First of all, let me tell you something. I'm perfectly happy staying home with my bride. So there. So there. Mm. I actually like being with my wife. I actually like hanging out with her. I enjoy sitting down watching Christmas shows with her. Like, I don't need to go anywhere and do anything else. I'm always speaking to that mountain saying, that's a lie. Well, you know, you were made for so much more. That's a lie. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. You know, you have a real gift and a real ability, son. You could be. That's a lie. The Lord is my shepherd. I don't lack anything. I don't want for nothing, man. I got everything I want right here. Don't tell me you've never had thoughts like that. Look over at your spouse. Ugh, should have married somebody else. No, I never felt like that. But there are people who actually someday they wake up and they say, well, I made a mistake. Or worse yet, worse yet, they go to their high school reunion and they think they're the stud that they were back then. <sighs> Ew. You are a married person. Act it. Well, yeah, I got married, but she's the one that's married. I'm not. Stop. There's all kinds of corny, goofy things that go on in people's heads, and you wonder why. Because they don't take charge of their thought life. And there's that mountain looking at them, mocking them. And Jesus said, nobody's eating from you ever again. Guess what? You ain't. I'm sorry. You are not going to intimidate me ever again. You are not ever going to manipulate me ever again. Works for me. Hope it works for you. 